As the settling of the American West continued, mines and mining towns played a crucial role in the development of the western territories of the United States. When precious minerals such as gold, silver, and copper were discovered in the western territories of the United States, thousands of Americans flocked west with the hope of gaining wealth through mining. The first major mining boom began in 1849 when gold was discovered in California. This led to the California Gold Rush and the first major migration of American settlers moving west with the hopes of mining and gaining wealth. Approximately 10 years later, gold was discovered in Colorado and the famous slogan Pike's Peak or Bust became synonymous with the mining industry and the mining boom. During this discovery, we saw many of the dangers of mining, as prospectors were routinely fooled and misled by other miners who hoped to protect their claim and interests in the region. This led to many prospectors being bankrupted and losing their fortunes and savings, as well as prospectors dying and being killed um, when they were unprepared for the conditions of mining in the Rocky Mountains. One year after the discovery of gold in Colorado, one of the single largest discoveries of minerals occurred when gold and silver were discovered in Virginia City, Nevada. This became known as the Comstock Lode and was one of the first true bonanzas and large discoveries of minerals. The Comstock Lode would go on to produce over $500 million in gold and silver and became one of the first instances of mining being a big business and major industry in the Western Territories of the United States. Lastly, in 1874, an expedition led by U.S. Army Officer George Custer discovered gold in the Black Hills of South Dakota. When Custer and the United States government attempted to persuade the Lakota and Sioux Indians to sell or lease their land to miners, Sioux and Lakota refused, which led to conflicts. These conflicts eventually developed into the Battle of Little Bighorn, in which Custer was killed, and eventually the massacre at Wounded Knee, when Native Americans continued to protest, being forced onto reservations and giving up their tribal land. As mines and mining towns developed, workers faced a variety of dangers in this new lifestyle. In the biggest and deepest mines, working conditions were often unsafe and dangerous. Due to the lack of equipment for many miners, as well as difficult and dangerous systems of elevators that were used to enter the mines, workers could be easily killed or injured. Once workers entered the mine, they encountered poorly lit tunnels, which provided little oxygen and that were filled with dust from drilling and digging, um, as well as dirt that was kicked up. The lack of oxygen, combined with this dust and dirt, led to serious lung problems such as black lung, emphysema, and tuberculosis, which were often fatal. In addition to these day-to-day -day dangers, there was also the possibility for explosions, fires, um, and flooding, which would lead to cave-ins and miners being trapped and killed in the mines themselves. Despite all these dangers, miners were often paid very poorly and felt that they were receiving unfair wages and encountering discrimination compared to other prospectors and mine owners. This led to the creation of mining unions being formed. One of the largest mining unions, the Miners Protective Association, or MPA, was one of the most successful examples of miners demanding and receiving better working conditions. The MPA fought for increased wages for mine workers, improved working conditions with increased safety measures, as well as shorter hours for mine workers. Unions such as the MPA would go on to join up with other unions such as steel unions and railroad unions as the railroad and steel industries would develop in the late 1800s. The final part of mining town development that became dangerous was the development of boom towns. Um, boom towns get their name because they opened very quickly when a mine was discovered and opened, and then disappeared just as quickly once the mine ran dry and the mine was closed. 
once these towns disappeared, they became known as ghost towns due to the fact that all of the buildings, such as the general store, the saloon, the boarding houses, still existed, but all of the people had disappeared and moved on to another mining town. Boom towns were often dangerous places because they developed very quickly, um, and disputes often arose over land claims um, and you know arguments over um, mining claims uh, throughout the region. Due to a lack of law and order, a variety of gangs and vigilantes developed where people often took um, the law into their own hands and resolved conflicts between themselves. Uh, during this time, um, some of the most famous lawmen of the West, such as Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, and Doc Holliday, would attempt to control these conditions um, by creating law enforcement agencies in the West and becoming deputized um, by, um, you know, government officials in those regions. Uh, when these men attempted to take over, it often led to conflicts with the gangs and vigilantes, such as the famous um, Battle of the OK Corral, or the shootout at the OK Corral, um, involving Wyatt Earp and his band of lawmen. While women existed in significantly fewer numbers than men, um, they played an important role in the development of mining towns and the West. Women often um, ran establishments such as saloons, um, as well as um, washing, making, and selling clothes to miners, um, chopping wood and other supplies uh, that miners would need. Um, in the event that women came with um, a husband, they would raise the family while the husband um, worked in the mines. And women taught in the town schools, uh, or wrote for the newspapers, um, providing information about mining claims that were for sale or changing hands, um, so that townspeople in the boom towns um, could could stake claim to those new discoveries uh, or purchase them if they had the funds available to do so. As more and more mining towns began to spring up, the need to connect these towns and their mines together became crucial to the development of the West. This led to the creation of a variety of railroad lines throughout the Western territories of the United States. Due to the fact that these lines were often run independently and were very disorganized, in the early 1860s, the United States began the process of creating what became known as the Transcontinental Railroad. This process began when Abraham Lincoln signed the Railroad Acts of 1862 and 1864 with the goal of connecting the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States through one continuous rail line. <clears throat> this would allow American settlers as well as resources and supplies and goods such as the gold and silver to be transported more efficiently and more quickly throughout the United States. <clears throat> The process of building the railroad began in 1863 when the first track was laid, and early on, the development of the Transcontinental Railroad suffered a number of problems due to the fact that only small companies were involved. This led to disputes over what route would be best and how the track should be laid throughout the Western Territory, as well as the ability of companies to develop the funds that were needed to undertake such a massive project. When these companies could not seek out private investors who were willing to invest their funds in the creation of the railroad, the United States government began to offer incentives to help promote the process. This included giving public land to rail companies so that they would have additional territory that they could develop along the rail lines and make money from, as well as providing low-interest loans to the companies based on the amount of track that they were laying. The United States government even went so far as creating a contest to incentivize companies to, rail as, to lay as much railroad track as possible. In these contests, the prizes were often government loans or um, free tax dollars that would be given through grants that did not need to be paid back. This led to the creation of two of the biggest railroad companies, the Union Pacific Railroad, and the Central Pacific Railroad, who received over 20 million acres 
of land and who were given over $60 million in taxpayer money to help promote the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. As these two companies competed, each one took on an important role in the process. The Union Pacific began laying its track in the state of Nebraska and moved westward towards the Rocky Mountains. This company, which was headed by Jack Casement and Dan Casement, used mostly Irish Americans as their workers, as well as Union Army veterans, once the Civil War was over. The Union Pacific was the most successful railroad company and laid more track than any other company due to the fact that its terrain was largely flat, easy-to-develop land throughout the Great Plains. As it created its railroad lines, the Union Pacific set up towns and railroad stations every 60 miles so that uh, farmers, miners, and cattle ranchers could more easily bring their goods to the railroad lines and load them onto the trains. <clears throat> While the Union Pacific was developing its track, it did encounter some problems, including um, conflicts with Native Americans, as well as a difficulty getting supplies, such as iron rails and timbers for laying the track, um, as well as food, water, um, and other basic goods that the workers needed. Um, in some cases, there were even disputes among workers because of um, working conditions, higher pay rates for some workers, um, and other differences in discrimination between workers, um, which slowed down the process for the Union Pacific. Uh, despite these problems, the Union Pacific was the most successful um, railroad uh, corporation during this time period, and played an important role in the development of states in the, mid, the Midwest um, and the Great Plains. Uh, while the Union Pacific was moving westward, the Central Pacific Railroad Company began to lay their track in Sacramento, California, and moved eastward towards the Rocky Mountains. This company, which was headed by Charles Crocker, hired mostly Chinese workers who became known as Crocker's Pets due to the conditions that they were forced to work in. Uh, in many instances, these workers who uh, were Chinese immigrants and who had come here because of the gold rush were forced into uh, the railroad industry as indentured servants and workers. Um, despite being very hard workers um, and very good workers, uh, these Chinese immigrants often faced discrimination um, in terms of the wages and the working conditions that they were forced to work in. Uh, on these jobs uh, and were given some of the poorest housing um, and food, uh, you know, conditions, uh, as well as some of the most dangerous jobs on the construction of the railroad. This discrimination and poor condition led to a significant number of Chinese immigrants um, being injured, killed, or worked to death uh, as the Central Pacific Railroad developed. Uh, just like the Union Pacific, the Central Pacific encountered some challenges. Um, however, these challenges were mostly due to the terrain that they had to um, navigate as they conducted uh, their operations, due to the fact that they had to go over, around, and through both the Sierra Nevada Mountains and the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Uh, they faced a variety of challenges related to the weather, um, avalanches, and had delays as they, as they had to dig through um, or use explosives to create tunnels and, and navigate the mountains of, of California and Colorado. Eventually, these two rail lines would connect at a location known as Promontory Point. Uh, Promontory Point, which is in the state of Utah, is the location where these two railroads were finally connected in 1869. So, uh, you know, in, in a fairly quick and efficient process, uh, the United States was able to connect Nebraska to California in approximately six years uh, with the help of the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railroads. Uh, where these railroads met at Promontory Port, a gold spike was used to unite the two railroad lines together and create the point where the Transcontinental Railroad was officially finalized. As a result of the Transcontinental Railroad, um, 
the Western territories and mining towns that were developing saw a lot of benefits. Uh, populations grew fairly quickly uh, because of the ease of transporting workers and supplies um, throughout the country. And an economic boom occurred as new industries developed um, and jobs were created to support the railroad and the mining towns. Uh, people were now able to produce and ship raw materials. They were able to take the gold, silver, and other metals and ship them. Um, people were able to create finished products such as tools, clothing, um, and, and other goods that were now purchased by the people traveling and living in these mining towns. Uh, and overall, um, after 1869, the states in the western part of the United States um, and territories that had yet to become states uh, saw a significant amount of economic growth due to mining and the creation of 